It is neither proper nor equitable that Americans should be denied the benefits of housing owned by the federal government or financed through the federal assistance on the basis of their race, color, creed, or national origin. First, we're going to have to uh, lay the facts on the line uh, about the existence of discrimination in housing. Uh, we're going to have to educate the public to the fact that it is an existing thing which is a real problem. It is clearly against the law to segregate people in these projects, yet there are many projects which are still segregated. Even in Sacramento, California, Our speaker at this session, Mr. Nathaniel Colley, is a well-known attorney in our community. Besides his general law practice in Sacramento, he has been the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's Council in Sacramento and San Francisco public housing cases. I regard it a distinct honor and privilege to present Mr. Colley to you. Today, I'm to discuss with you the subject of desegregation in housing. You might be surprised to know that the federal government has facilitated segregation in housing in this country. In fact, the federal government can be accused of actually causing it. These are harsh charges, but these charges are true. Part of the reason this history is important is because the inequalities that we see today have a long history. Starting in the 1920s, for instance, when California's population really began to grow, we find that the more people that came here of different ethnicities in greater numbers, the more temptation there was to discriminate against those groups if there were preconceived prejudices against them. So we begin to see things like restrictive covenants and housing deeds. It was a big part of the National Association of Real Estate Boards across the United States. And they were very instrumental in guiding local real estate branches across the country on how to use race covenants to preserve the value of their properties. And these covenants usually provided that at no time should the land be used, occupied, or owned by any person except persons of the Caucasian race and builders and subdividers could exclude entire ethnic groups from whole neighborhoods by placing restrictive covenants on the land. There was actually a hierarchy of ethnicities that they wanted, that they preferred for those neighborhoods, and others that they didn't. And sometimes these hierarchies were listed in order from Western Europeans all the way down to Negroes and Mexicans as a language uh, put back in those days. Now, as they do this and they promote this exclusionary type of housing, they also become the administrators for FHA. And this is how we got race covenants as a condition of FHA financing. And this notion of relating race to value also was prominent in the way we decided who got to live in public housing. So you see all this public housing going across the United States and similarly, you will see this process of segregation around the housing developments and sometimes within the housing developments. But the big problem here is that when you use government funds, public funds, to create housing, it's supposed to provide equal access. Well, New El Viso was a housing project that was built in 1941, Sacramento's first public housing project. And uh, as time went along and pe more people moved into the 310 some odd units that were there, certain practices began to take a place that uh, reflected discriminatory practices by the Sacramento Housing Authority. They had 16 black households that were segregated in one section apart from the white households. This went on for a number of years until it was discovered by Nathaniel Colley. He went back and talked to local members of the NAACP and so they determined that what they would do was take a few of those black tenants and get them to be part of a lawsuit against the Sacramento Housing Authority. So on February 1st, 1952, Superior Court Judge J.L. Henry determined that the Sacramento Housing Authority was in violation of anti-discriminatory laws that were on the books at that time. And that case that Kali got the injunction for was actually the first of its kind 
involving public housing in the entire United States as far as we know. And it was believed that the housing authority would in good faith honor that injunction. And of course, Kali years later stated that in his opinion, discrimination in New Hope Visa was still ongoing. Where there is an injunction against the Sacramento Housing Authority prohibiting them from segregating, you will find that the vast majority of the Negro people live in one little geographical area. And you will also find that the few Caucasians in between are usually of Mexican ancestry. Well, the truth of the matter is we didn't have any objection to living next to people of Mexican ancestry. We were simply trying to point out that while they were complying with the letter of the law, certainly they were not complying with the spirit of it. And in my judgment, they have still not complied. Hello? Won't you join us for a trip? A trip depicting life in Sacramento, 1950. And of course, a growing community means more homes, more places to live, more people buying a little bit of earth and a house to go on it, to call all their own. Well, the work that Kali did in terms of public housing also had a counterpart in the private housing sector that needed to be resolved. The most important phase of housing at this time is that ensured by the FHA or the Veterans Administration. This group of housing constitutes over 90 percent of all the new housing constructed in this country since 1940. Well, what has been the record in that housing? For these projects, they were being sold to white veterans and to white homeowners or prospective buyers, but not to blacks who are also veterans and who are also home buyers. And so this leaves us this predicament of a growing Sacramento where we actually have three military sites and they're using by law minority labor in these places. So now you're seeing the rise of a new middle class that's able to afford places like Arden Park, Country Club, uh, Town and Country Village, all these places coming up where they can live in just about any place because they have the income to do it. So Nathaniel Colley uh, ran across a case where an uh, African-American gentleman by the name of Oliver Ming, an employee of McClellan Air Force Base, wanted to buy a house in a subdivision that was being built near the North Highlands area, which is, was, uh, of course, in the northern part of Sacramento County. And uh, he went to the actual site to try to negotiate the thought of buying a home out there and was told, no, we do not sell to, to black people, literally, in his face. Many Americans are amazed to know that up until the year of our Lord, 1950, our great federal government required, mark my word, I did not say permitted, I said the federal government required restrictive covenants on land insured by FHA. So now the, these builders become the proxy for the federal government to refuse housing to people who can actually afford it just on the basis of color. So the intent here was to actually keep our new neighborhoods segregated. Of course, the theory behind fair housing is that nobody is to be discriminated against. All fair housing does is try to make housing available to all people without regard to race, color, or creed. It seems to me this is fundamental in the American system, but somehow we have not been able to sell that idea to people. So we've got over 10,000 new homes in Land Park and Arden Park and all these new places in between. And so we're over 10,000, but we don't have one person of color living in any of them. They had to go outside of these boundaries, outside of these racially exclusive boundaries to buy their home. This is how we see Glenn Elder pop up in the middle of nowhere because it was the formation of a separate but equal type of residential development here. And, you know, without the infrastructure and buses and things of this sort and gutters and things of this sort, we're building new homes out there. This is the only place where a minority can use an FHA loan. Now we have this situation where there's an inequity. We've already shown in the new Helvetia case that you cannot discriminate with federal funds. But here, we're doing the exact thing that that new Helvetia case fought for. 
So the main case really drives home this flaw in public policy that Kali is exposing to people. During his closing arguments, Kali approached the judge and made sure that he heard and understood the importance and gravity of what this particular decision would mean. And that quote states, one who dips his hand into the pocket of the federal treasury must not complain if a little democracy clings to it. But Oliver Ming was the first case that we know of that spoke to this idea that any federal funds being used for private housing acquisition could not discriminate on the basis of race. Ming wins this case, and they award him one dollar in damages. One dollar in damages. You know, this is a guy who is all over town trying to find a house he can move into, and he's awarded one dollar for all of his injury, which, you know, is basically a slap in the face to this whole process, this legal process that Kali was, was rolling out for us. And the FHA is just getting around to being goaded into trying to assist in making this housing available to all without regard to race, color, or creed. I have today signed an executive order directing federal departments and agencies to take every proper and legal action to prevent discrimination in the sale or lease of housing facilities owned or operated by the federal government, housing constructed or sold as a result of loans or grants to be made by the federal government, or by loans to be insured or guaranteed by the federal government. I have directed the housing agency and other appropriate agencies to use their good offices to promote and encourage the abandonment of discriminatory practices that may now exist. In conclusion, let me say that it is my opinion that housing segregation is the key to the entire fight for desegregation in America. Until we desegregate housing, all of our other efforts will be of limited consequence. And so when we try to sum all of this up, what Nathaniel Colley is trying to say here is how housing has this major impact on all of our lives. Because where we live is our first exposure to all the things that make us productive in society. Our education, our employment, the churches we go to, the recreation we have around us, what people call the social determinants of health comes from where we live. And so when neighborhoods are deficient, when they don't have parks, when they don't have schools and STEM programs, when they don't have healthcare and hospitals, people suffer. This actually impacts their ability to earn income. When our income is affected, where we live also becomes affected. So that you can see these patterns of discrimination that happened years ago actually impact the future. And so even though Kali was clear that you can't use these government benefits to promote segregation, it did not get rid of other issues that were still at the forefront in the fight for fair housing during that time. You know, it did not get rid of redlining. Lenders could still redline on the basis of race. It did not get rid of the use of color in the appraisal process. So we still see this rampant discrimination across the city. Isn't the NAACP also finding fault with housing practices within California? Yes, there's widespread evidence in this regard, and when the lawsuit comes, I think people will see that the state agencies have much power to do something about housing discrimination, but they have done nothing about it. How long do you expect this, this legal battle to, to take? Well, I don't know, but as uh, some general said, once we're prepared to fight on this line all winter, we're prepared to fight on this line for many years if it takes that.